Uh, here's my title, Calibration of Pattern Formation Model by Tactical Methods, collaboration with uh, Alexei Kasanikov, who was our <coughs> PhD student in Finland, and now works with uh, Rob and Anna in Heidelberg. Okay, so the background and motivation of this uh, talk is that, as you know, this pattern formation is a important topic in chemi chemistry and, and biology, but it's not so sure what actually are the uh, mechanism behind it. So several competing theories do exist, and they should be then, of course, validated as usually <coughs> against some real data. But the issue here is that in many cases, only the kind of limit situation, the final pattern, is available as data. And uh, we don't know the transient uh, behavior or the initial values of the, of the situation. And this is the problem I'm kind of addressing here. Because in some cases you might have other data as well, but uh, now we focus on this case where we only have this kind of steady state patterns available and want to see how much with that limited data we can actually uh, calibrate the models and also discriminate them each against each other. So, one way to go forward is that we actually just kind of integrate out the initial values by randomizing. But then the uh, situation is that even with the fixed uh, model, fixed parameter values, we always get the new realization of the uh, as a solution. So, uh, we actually have a family of patterns instead of a given uh, pattern in the simulation. And that means that the usual ways to measure discrepancy between model and, and, and data is not there. The residual cannot be kind of directly computed. So here already is the kind of situation. By the way, this works. We start with some initial values we have here. The typical three, uh, uh, this kind of Turing pattern formation models, Pitsuk, Nagumogir, Mairad, but this Brusselator. So we start with initial values in a 2D uh, square, and then gradually the system goes to some limit case here. And uh, even when we have fixed model parameters, we get uh, different uh, solutions, but they always can kind of look like each other. They kind of come from the same family of solutions. And when we then take a different enough color parameter, then we start getting uh, different looking uh, patterns. And then the issue is how to, when we have a given fixed data available, <coughs> how can we kind of make a likelihood that would capture this kind of uh, bit in variability of the fixed situation against something where, where the model or the biological system is going to in some systematic way. And the approach we have been developing is based on certain type of Gaussian feature vectors. And uh, here are a couple of older papers. We actually started with uh, a analogical situation uh, with chaotic dynamics. Because that system is analogical in the sense that always when we change whatever small thing in the uh, simulation, we get a different trajectory. But typically, uh, they are samples from the same underlying attractor anyway. So something remains fixed, but something is always kind of changing. So again, there's no way to, if you have long time integration, to actually kind of time-wise computer residuals. And uh, uh, the approach, which I soon will be showing, has been applied already in, in a certain version, but I will then here discuss, of course, the approach itself, but also some kind of further development we are now working together with these people in, in Heidelberg. Especially, uh, we still needed uh, something like at least 50 patterns to get things working in the earlier version, but now we can work even with one pattern. Uh, a little bit jump 
into the kind of statistical background here uh, to give some idea of what we are actually doing. And I mentioned this so-called synthetic likelihood or Bayesian synthetic likelihood. I don't know if it's well known to everybody here, but uh, it was uh, introduced by Simon Wood some time ago, and it's kind of alternative to ABC, uh, one might say. So the idea is that uh, in such a situation where we have a non-deterministic uh, simulation, as we have in these cases, we kind of create the likelihood for every parameter uh, proposed. We create the likelihood by repeated simulations, and then we test the data against that likelihood. So that was, has been studied since uh, the first paper uh, in several uh, publications by this mostly, I guess, Australian school. However, we have some is issues here uh, because we need, at every uh, proposed parameter, we need several simulations. Then the CPU, especially the model itself, is expensive. Then the, it's kind of getting very high CPU approach. And moreover, uh, typically people just assume that what we get as a summary statistics is Gaussian, but it's not actually uh, always the case. So the, uh, another topic here is what is the summary statistics to be used. And uh, what we have been employing here is something that goes back to this so-called Donsker theorem, kind of classical theorem from the 50s, which says that in the, in the basic form, that if you have scalar valued IID random variables, we normalize the uh, empirical distribution function, then it turns with increasing n into a Gaussian process, which has the nice property that when we know the distribution function, we also know the covariance. <coughs> of course, we have a finite data, so in a finite setting, we can still, this is not totally kind of approximately true, but what we can do, we have some uh, data, sample size n, we create uh, empirical CDF function at some given bins, and then uh, we have the uh, distribution function and we can get the covariance scaled by the number of points, and then we have actually a m-dimensional Gaussian likelihood. Of course, Gaussian has to be double-checked by, by uh, some classical tests. By the way, did I start a bit late or how much I have a time? <laughs> okay, I jump over this example here. So this can be used also in this case uh, as an alternative to ABC and so on, but uh, let's go back to the situation we are discussing now here. So uh, typically we want to avoid high CPU, and if you have enough data, then we can actually uh, avoid computation by creating a likelihood for a subset by subsampling. Also, I, uh, our data is no more IID, and it's not scalar, it's vector valued. But what we can do, first of all, there are theorems that tell that actually uh, this construction still is Gaussian. What we can do uh, to construct the likelihood is in this kind of caricature uh, for a chaotic situation first, it's kind of analogical in our patterns as well. So we take uh, samples from our data, compute the distance, and do that for uh, all the uh, point cloud points here. And we get the empirical CDF here in a log look scale. And then we repeat this between all, all pairs of data, and we get the number of vectors. And then we simply compute the mean covariance of that and double check that uh, the Gaussianity is valid. So then we apply this for this uh, pattern formation cases. First, this uh, classical ones, where we have always a diffusion part and then the nonlinearity which is changing in these different cases. Maybe I will bit jump over these formulas. They are more or less familiar to you. If not, then you don't get the details anyway. 
But the uh, only difference is that nonlinearity is, is uh, different in each case. So now when we have the construction for the likelihood, we can start with an uh, initial guess for a parameter and by using some optimization here, we have been using the difference evolution algorithm to be converts to a final distribution. It looks like a point here. But if we zoom there a little bit and double check what happens, then here are the uh, posteriors in each case. And we have kind of test verified uh, simulations here taken from these different points. And in this case, what can, we can see that actually uh, you maybe don't see any difference by naked eye between those. So the approach is more accurate than the naked eye in this case, where we have actually used 500 patterns as the data. Okay, in that case, the only uh, feature of the scalar mapping from the pattern to a scalar, we need this scalar mapping because we are using a uh, was only done by the distance, L2 distance between, between the patterns. But of course, we can use other norms as well. Any, any similar norms, actually, as we have a 2D uh, surface here. So we can use any of these uh, typical norms. And when we do that, we get something like this. So <clears throat> here are again the same usual suspects. And we have been using different uh, norms separately and compute the posteriors. And then we use all them together. We see this yellow region here. So it means that when we have we take several uh, norms, we get much uh, more accurate results. By the way, this non-normalized normalized means that here we have used the full solution as such, but in this normalized case, we have to take the pattern for pattern only, so we normalize the kind of valleys and hills plus minus one. So we can only use what we see the real values. So we get the larger posteriors because we lose information, but they still are kind of more or less nicely given. Okay. Uh, you can also go back to very limited amount of data, back to uh, even one uh, picture, and still get things working, but then with, with more CPU time, because then now we are using the synthetic likelihood approach here. We have just one limited data, and we, for each uh, proposal, we have to create the likelihood from scratch. So, say, so make many simulations. Okay, then uh, uh, to the cases we are now working with the Heidelberg group. Uh, so they are testing different uh, ways of how, how the pattern can be formed with mechanochemical models, where they have produced this kind of fancy uh, 3D pictures. So this is very time consuming computation so far. What we actually have been doing is more uh, limited in 1D and 2D so far. Anyway, the idea here is that um, this um, tissue curvature would play the kind of long-range inhibitor role together with the, with the chemistry. So not only the kind of dif different diffusion uh, coefficients are making the patterns, but the kind of mechanical forces as well. Here's one example where the we have the tissue in 1D and then the concentration here. I jump over that. This is just an example that even in the 1D, this leads to a bit complicated looking models. I don't got the details here. But uh, there are also other possible mechanisms like this uh, kind of combined ODE, PDE system where we have one part. Uh, test as an OD without any uh, space variable, and then the other part has the diffusion, and they are kind of coupled together. So, results look something like this. And um, in all these cases, then we have been uh, able again to, from that kind of pattern formation, uh, the pattern data uh, to compute the posteriors of the respective parameters. So we have a couple of examples again, and this yellow means that we have used several norms and 
get the kind of intersection of the possible individual posteriors. And some more examples there. Uh, one word about uh, numerical integration. So this is, of course, often time consuming and luckily our Alexei is a nerd and likes to use this GPU uh, processors in very effective way. And also our collaborator Robert Scheichel is a numerical guy, so we are developing that now. Numerical methods are uh, different for the mechanical, mechanochemical and different for the reaction diffusion actually to somehow optimally compute the forward simulations in different cases and hopefully can get to true 2D or 3D mechanochemical cases in the not so far future. Okay, so my conclusions are here. So what the, this BSL is this Bayesian uh, likelihood approach. And GSL is what we call happy called Gaussian subset likelihood, kind of uh, little bit uh, opposite ways of forming the likelihoods. So when we have a large amount of data, we can use this subset likelihood. We often need to use it for CPU reasons, but with limited data, we use kind of opposite approach, opposite the sense that we uh, in simulations create lots of cases and then create a likelihood while while in this GSL we use lots of data and, and create likelihood kind of offline. Has been applied to first of all these chaotic side of dynamics, also SDE systems and uh, some other applications as well, like synchronization. Uh, some of course issues are here as well. So we need this color value mapping from the original high dimensional data into, into scholars and that of course has to be selected kind of carefully so that it kind of characterizes what we actually have in the, in the data. But it's been more or less uh, intuitive what to do actually on that level. And what is next is this model discrimination for these different uh, cases of different uh, theories of how, how the patterns can be formed. So we make patterns with one model and try to fit the other model to that distribution can kind of more or less quantitatively say it, uh, can we are they are two different models or theories kind of distinguishable with some certain amount of data and we are also working with some other applications like this face separation can hilliard and maybe several other ones also next they all share the same uh, analogy again that with a given uh, initial values, we always get uh, different, but in some sense similar uh, solutions. Okay, that's all. I have some references there, I guess, which you can download if, if you like. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, great talk. Do we have any questions? Okay. Um, perhaps I didn't understand it quite um, well. Um, I was wondering when you said to in order to construct a synthetic like either by the Bayesian approach or not, do you need uh, data uh, sets of patterns in time? Given uh, a one set of initial condition, or you are trying to, or were you, were you try, or do you need different using the, the patterns generated from different initial condition? So we don't, in these cases, don't use the kind of time dependent evolution of the patterns at all. Only the kind of steady state. So that was the kind of limitation we started with. We only have a pattern or several patterns, and that can be used as data to calibrate. The Model parameters, right? So, so would, um, in, if in order to to sort of uh, inference on the parameters for a time-dependent PD or ODE, what do you think needs to well, be? We can, we can. That is actually that was the first uh, application. This chaotic dynamic system. Then we of course have time, time uh, there. So we, we can do it also with time. And this 
Kan hinder for instance is a time dependent system. In that case, the end result is not interesting. The faces are just separated. So we can use both if they are available, but if they are not available, then we can use this kind of steady state limit values of the patterns only as well. Because I would imagine for your application for the cellular automata that the, 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 um, it would be quite different since you can't really get a steady state solution from that, then how would you? How would you do the inference there? Uh, I would imagine the pattern would change because the the, stochast the stochasticity came from different the, the rules that you apply for the birth and deaths. Yeah, I maybe don't get totally your question, but anyway, we can use uh, time dependent data as well. And for instance, in these systems, uh, dynamical systems and SDE systems, that is what we actually use. Okay, thank you. Hey, yeah, thank you for your great talk. Uh, I wasn't familiar with the idea of a synthetic likelihood before, but just to recap, so basically you, you stimulate measurements and then you translate this into some feature vector, which you choose, I'm guessing, the features, and then you com construct the likelihood making a Gaussian assumption. Um, is this how this works? Uh, yes, especially in this... Uh synthetic likelihood case. Yeah. We simulate every step. But then when, if you have enough data, then and and we don't want to simulate too much, or we can't simulate because it's on CPU reasons, then we uh, use the data, exi existing data to create the likelihood offline and then start. Uh, are there sort of, the, um, I'm guessing there's uh, some information loss involved depending on which features you choose. Is it sort of similar to ABC, some criteria which guarantee convergence or? Yes, for instance, uh, in this chaotic dynamics, if you just use some mean and, and uh, STD or some linear projections, it doesn't work so well because the underlying object has this kind of strange uh, attractor uh, form. So the geometry has to be taken into account. And that, that was the intuition, the beginning to start with this kind of fractal dimension based concepts. What this uh, is behind there. I didn't have time to go to details too much, but that was the idea to kind of take the geometry into account and use something which already has been used to characterize those kind of attractor, these fractal dimension things. But we are not computing the intrinsic fractal dimension because we all want to get distances between different trajectories. Not, we are not interested, in, interested as such in the intrinsic uh, characteristics, but differences. Okay, any other questions? No, in that case, well, let's thank Heiki once more. Thank you.